Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today we're finishing up our two-part series entitled, Sleeping with the Enemy. And this message, part two, is entitled, Samson. If there ever was anyone who so blatantly and so peacefully slept with the enemy, I would have to say it would have to be Samson. In many ways, though, the story of Samson is a really sad one. So let us turn our attention, please, to Judges chapter 16, verse 15 through 22. Then she said to him, How can you say, I love you, when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head was shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, Come back once more. He has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. After putting him to sleep on her lap, she, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair, and so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, gorged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. They set him to grind in grain in the prison. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Samson, the promised son of Manoah and his barren wife, judged Israel for 20 years, but he could not correctly judge character. He seemingly had no discernment. He could not tell whether they were for him or against him. He just could not tell. The Bible tells us that he had extraordinary strength. But where did his strength lie? The angel of the Lord said he was to be a Nazarite, dedicated to God all his life. He was not to drink any strong drink or wine or eat any unclean food. Neither was he to eat anything that comes from the vine. His mother either was not supposed to drink any of those things as long as she was pregnant with, with Samson. Manoah and his wife were supposed to train Samson up in the things of God. They were supposed to direct his steps along the paths of righteousness. He was supposed to be trained in the knowledge of his God that he might know his God intimately. But Samson loved women, but not just any women, Philistine women. Samson loved the female enemy. Of all people, known and unknown, I would venture to say that Samson was the most deliberate when it comes to sleeping with the enemy. I would say that he is the epitome of sleeping with the enemy. The first account of Samson as a grown man is found in Judges chapter 14, verse 1. Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. I want to remind you of what Samson's mission in life was. Look with me, please, at Judges chapter 13, verse 5. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Samson, Samson, your mission is to save Israel from their enemies, the Philistines, not to intermarry with them. Yet, Samson's first mention is a strong desire to climb into the bed of the enemy. There's a saying, the grass always looked greener on the other side. 
And for Samson, the grass was really looking green on the enemy's side. And he wanted to see what that green grass was all about. His parents tried to discourage him from, from, from such a choice, from making that a wrong decision. But his mind was made up. He was determined to sleep with the enemy. And nothing they said could change his mind. That's how it is with us today. We know the dangers. We see the signs. But we just can't help ourselves climbing into bed with the enemy. And why? Look with me, please, at what Samson tells his parents and what they say to him. Judges chapter 14, verse 1 through 3. Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all her people? that you must go take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. Samson went down to Timnah. In other words, Samson went down to the enemy's camp, but he was not looking to take back that which he, the enemy had stolen from him. He was not even looking for their weakness. He wasn't even went down there to be encouraged as God had sent, sent Gideon down into the enemy's camp to be encouraged when he was to attack them. He was looking to fraternize with the enemy and thus started the sad history or the sad story of sleeping with the enemy. Look at Judges chapter 14 verse 2. This is what Samson said. I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. He saw a daughter of the enemy and he wanted her as his wife. But then his parents said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all the people that you must take, go and take your wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? Samson, son, these people are not even a part of God's covenant. They are our enemies. They are the uncircumcised. And you are a Nazarite. Why do you want to join them and, or join her in marriage? Why? Surely there must be someone amongst your own people that you can marry. Even someone in your own family, Samson would be better than your choice right now. How about Betty Sue? She's a nice girl. But Samson wasn't interested in Betty Sue. He wasn't interested in any of the hometown nice girls. He wanted to, 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 to go into the enemy's camp. He wanted to join with the enemy. He wanted what he was not supposed to have. And he wouldn't listen to reason. He said, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. And bam, there you have it. There is the key to the whole thing. No doubt Samson was a spoiled brat, being the promised son of a barren woman. He was given every single thing. According to Jewish Midrash, her barrenness, Samson's mother's barrenness was a source of argument for his parents. Manoah would accuse his wife of being barren, and she would accuse him of being sterile. And so when the angel of God came to her, he settled the whole dispute. And look at Judges chapter 13, verse 3. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. The angel of the Lord told her that she was barren, removing all doubt as to where the fault lie. Never before had any other barren woman had been told that they were barren or that she was barren. 
So when Manoah's wife relates this story to her husband, she conveniently leaves out the part where the angel of God told her that she was barren. She just said that this is what happened. But either way, there's little doubt that Samson was a small brat and insisted on having his own way, good or bad. He wanted it his way. And a lot of people are just like that today. The consequences of their decisions are right in front of their eyes. They see it. Other people can even point it out for them, making it very clear. But they insist on having their own way. They want it their way. Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. Samson says, she's right in my eyes. I don't care what you say. I don't care how it looks. I'm voting this way because it seems right to me. But we have to be so very careful with that mindset, with that way of thinking. Because the scripture says in, in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. They're creating laws that force you to go on the wrong path, forcing you to turn away from, from, from things of righteousness. From these, you are to turn away. Anytime they lead you in the wrong direction, turn away. God is the most important thing. I read an article in the Daily Mail online just the other day. Let me read a snip from, from that article, if I can. It says, and I quote, A new Victorian law which forces mothers and fathers to accept their children's desire to change gender as, has left distraught parents fearing prosecution if they do anything to try to prevent potentially harmful and irreversible treatment. So far-reaching is the new law that even trying to arrange counseling and expert assessment for their kids could lead to parents and the mental health professionals being prosecuted if the advice did anything other than affirm the, ch the children's newly discovered gender dysphoria. So you can't even seek the help of experts or ask the advice of health professionals before your children are given potentially harmful and irreversible treatment to something that they might be just going through a phase with or, 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 or that they've been brainwashed or, or tricked into believing to think away. But let's, let's read on. Many parents feel trapped, unable to do anything to prevent their children pursuing potentially irreversible and harmful changes, from chest binding to taking hormone blockers and ultimately sex change surgery. And while the parents are powerless to intercede, their kids are often subject to encouragement and cajoling from activists, pro-trans teachers and counselors. This is a scene right out of some bad, low-budget sci-fi movie. But it's not. This is real life. This is happening right now to real parents with real concerns in Australia. Continue reading. One parent even found text messages from a counselor to her daughter advising a child to leave home so she could escape her sceptical parents and freely pursue her newly found wish to transition to being a boy. Fearful of, of prosecution, parents in this predicament have formed a clandestine network to exchange ideas on how to approach the legal minefield laid down by the change of Suppression Conversion Practices Prohibition Act 2021. End of quote. Whenever there is a disaster and Christians send shipments of food, shipments of water, shipments of clothing, and then they let the recipients know that Jesus loves them, we are quickly accused of stuffing a religion down their throats. So let me just quickly ask this question. Is that not stuffing their religion?
religion down our throats? Inquiring minds want to know. We had better wake up. We had better open up our eyes and see what is really happening. We had better wake up and start praying for our different nations. We had better wake up and stop resting our heads in the lap of the enemy. We had better stop sleeping in the enemy's lap. They keep making more and more laws that are more and more restrictive to Christians and more and more invasive to families. Needless to say, the relationship did not work out for Samson. But just like our politicians keep making more and more laws to father and father restrict, so Samson kept making more and more ungodly relationships until he meets his disaster. Samson and his parents went down to Timnah to get this young woman for Samson as his wife because she was right in Samson's eyes. Twice now, the scripture states that Samson said she was right in his eyes. But is she though? Is she really right for Samson? So, Samson tells a, a, a riddle to his wedding companions, the young Philistine men who, who would attend him at his wedding. And if they could answer the, the, the riddle correctly, Samson would give them 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. But if they did not answer correctly, then they would have to give Samson 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. And wouldn't you know it? His wife kept bugging him and pestering him until he told her the answer to his riddle. And then she in turn told the young man, and it cost Samson 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. So that relationship did not work out for Samson. But he didn't learn his lesson with sleeping with the enemy. That did not teach him a lesson as they say. He needed more. He desired more more. Then he meets Delilah. And if you read the story of Samson and De Delilah, she had no good intentions for Samson. From the very beginning, she had nothing good in mind for him. But Samson just couldn't see it. She wasn't playing around with Samson. She wanted to go for the juggler. She wanted to know his Achilles heel. What is your secret? Or what is the secret of your great strength, Samson? So Samson tells her, if you buy me with seven fresh bowls that have not been dried, I will be as weak as any other man. So she puts Samson to sleep and she ties him up with these bowstrings. And then she shouts, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. When he wakes up and snaps the bowstrings and lives, she is upset with him and he entertains it. She tells him that he mocks her with lies and he, she pesters him to tell her the secret. So Samson tells her another lie about being bound with new ropes and she does the same thing again. Samson, the Philistines are upon you! And Samson escapes once more. Now look at Judges chapter 16, verse 13 and 14. Then Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me how you might be bound. And she said, and he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head with the web and fasten it tight with the pen, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So while he slept, Delilah took the seven locks of his head and wove them into the web. And she made them tight with the pen and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled away the pen, the loom, and the web. See, she does it again. She puts him to sleep. And when Samson is asleep, she does the same thing that will take away his weakness according to his words. And when Samson escapes, 
she puts on the water words and she accuses him of lying to her. So with, with crying and pleading and trying to make sense and look like or feel like the bad person in, in that relationship, like he's the one who is in the wrong, but isn't that how it is today? Those who are destroying our country and destroying the world are accusing those who are trying to keep it of, of the same thing that they are doing. Judges chapter 16, verse 15 through 16. And she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and you have not told me where your great strength lies. What, do you blame him? And when she pressed them hard with her words day after day and urged them, his soul was vexed to death. How can Samson begin to trust this woman? If it was me, I would be up and gone. I would, it would be like, adios Delilah, I'm out of here. But not Samson. Samson sticks around and he tells her everything. See, the truth is, we are just like that. We see the evidence of our votes. We see the evidence of the laws. We see the joblessness. We see the homelessness. We see our politicians living life in the lap of luxury. We see it all, but it just doesn't click for us. Just like it just didn't click for Samson. So what does Samson do? He told her his whole heart, everything. He tells her everything. He told her the secret of his great strength. Then what happened? Judges chapter 16, verse 19 through 21. She made him sleep on her knees. And she called a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him and his strength left him. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But, and this is a sad sentence, but he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him and gorged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles and he ground at the mill in the prison. She lulled Samson to sleep on her knees and she shaved his head. She took away all opportunity for survival from him. She left him flat, broke, and vulnerable. I wonder... And she was one of those in, in, in that celebration that they, when the Philistines had made a big feast to their god, Dagon. And they were sacrificing to Dagon. And then they called for Samson to come out of the prison to perform for them, that they may jeer at him, that they may make fun of, uh, at him. I wonder if Delilah was one of those tormented Samson in the crowds that day. Let me ask you, how many of you are being lulled to sleep right now on the knees of the enemy? How many of you had your head shaved? Jesus is our only rescue. Jesus is our only hope. So ask again, do you know Jesus? Do you know him as your Lord and Savior? Would you like to know Jesus and escape this great tragedy of not knowing who Jesus is? For those who do not know Jesus is condemned to an eternity of torment. Would you like to know Jesus as Lord and Savior? Here's how. Say this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Open my eyes, Lord, to see. Help me to see truth. Help me to recognize the enemy. Lord God, help me that I might not sleep 
with the enemy, but that I might be aware of his schemes. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for salvation. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for giving me life. I accept it now in Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Here's what I want you to do. Get a Bible. Read your Bible every single day. Highlight the verses that are meaningful, the promises that mean something to you. Learn those. Commit them to memory. Find yourself a Bible-believing church, not one of those progressive churches that you can live however you want, do whatever you want, live godly lives, do things that the Bible say are wrong. Find a Bible-believing church that believes in righteousness, believes in holiness. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. When Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is that you should be doing. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And he'll invite you into his kingdom. And there you'll be with him forever and ever. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Kenny Yates. This is Hold to Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.